Welcome everyone to another performance clinic. Today it's called Ensuring Digital Business Availability with Dynatrace. My guest of honor, Klaus Enzenhofer, Senior Technology Technical Pro uh, Product Manager. Sorry, Klaus. Uh, <laughs> My title should... changed, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's okay, but I, I guess I should be able to read. Um, anyway, Klaus, thanks for being with me again. You have done performance clinics with me in the past. And today, as you said earlier in the intro, uh, there's going to be a couple of Christmas presents because the, as the day of the recording, it's shortly before Christmas 2019. And you have a, cool, a lot of cool stuff with you around digital business availability. I think we'll hear around how we can do better uh, error diagnostics when people actually struggle with your web properties. Um, and that's it, right? So folks, yeah. uh, if you uh, have questions, put them into the question feature. If you want to give Dynatrace a try, you can see the links here. Uh, if you want to watch other videos, go to university.dynatrace.com or the YouTube channel. And last but not least, if you want to listen to some of the stories around performance engineering DevOps, listen to the Pure Performance Podcast. But now, Klaus, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. And actually, from a slight perspective, we're done right now, right here. Because uh, I know you guys uh, like to see more of our product and what we can do there and what is new and awesome here. And I want to jump here right away into our web application overview because uh, we have some new uh, things here for you. As you always know, um, or probably have heard from my side already, it's always about uh, some key performance metrics that uh, make up the user experience. Uh, there is the availability that we have right here that is really important because nothing is more annoying to a user than a system not being available to them. Uh, the other uh, metric that obviously impacts user is performance. We're a performance company. Uh, you care about performance. Everybody cares about performance these days. And bad performance, we all know, has an impact on the uh, revenue on the bottom line of uh, each company. And uh, last but not least, it is about errors. People who cannot transact, who have uh, issues with errors, that's something uh, that is really important uh, to know about as well. So let's start with availability first. I mean, we have here a perfectly set up application. So what I did uh, before we jumped into this, uh, in the, into this webcast is I started a SaaS application monitoring. I picked BBC uh, to be the uh, app of honor. So that's why we have that many uh, user interactions here on this page. But um, should you start monitoring, real user monitoring, uh, you will get automatically the performance and the error metrics. However, for availability, that's where you have to do something. And uh, we made it now really super easy for you. As you can see here in the lower right corner, we have here a new uh, one-click availability monitoring available for you. Uh, available for you with means uh, release 182. Uh, so if you are on 182, then uh, you're happy to have this feature here. Now what you can do actually is with a single click on this button here, and I'm purposely not clicking right now, you are setting automatically up for your top entry actions. And since I did just one, uh, uh, one run through the app, uh, we only have one loading off page. It automatically generates for uh, the top three landing pages uh, from three locations worldwide every 15 minutes a, a web check. A, a synthetic monitor against your uh, web application. With that, you have there immediately an availability number. So you are started there. And yeah, let me show you what happens, all you need to do is you click it, you're automatically getting here into the synthetic monitoring uh, view, and you actually have here uh, the first test for your application, and you're starting monitoring availability for it. I think that's uh, a massive improvement in the ease of use. I think uh, it will make your life easier to set up uh, 
synthetic monitoring and to get you started there. And you have uh, the first KPI uh, ready for your perfectly configured web app that you have perfectly monitored. So Klaus, yeah. uh, if I can just quickly kind of reiterate, because you're right, what I've also seen, and kind of to reiterate what you just did, you started with an empty application that you call BBC CO UK, right? That's the URL. Yep. Um, yep. And then I think what we've seen with a lot of our customers is that while you may have real user monitoring or when you start with setting up your application, the one thing that you definitely always want is set up a basic SLA monitor. And therefore, making this a one-click thing is really cool because nobody needs to go in and then kind of click through, provide the URL, and then set the locations and all that. It's just done automatically for you. And I think that's a, that's a cool convenience thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was my first Christmas present. Mm -hmm. Really short demo here. <laughs> the second one is a little bit of a longer uh, demo. Uh, maybe some of you have noticed uh, that uh, something has changed here on this uh, infographic and actually we removed something. We removed the word JavaScript here. So you see it, is, it says only errors here and the reason being is uh, we extended massively our capabilities in the error uh, sector. So we have really enhanced our JavaScript agent to deliver HTTP errors and also custom errors um, to you. Why have we brought HTTP errors uh, right here into uh, into our JavaScript agent and right into this uh, in, into those views? We usually dealt with it on the uh, server side with our host agents. However, there is between your users and your host agent uh, on the server side, there may be a CDN in between. Or in your website, you're introducing uh, third-party content right away, and those requests that are going off to your third-party provider never ever touch your data center. So our host agent will never ever have a chance to detect those errors. Hence, we said we need to improve here, we need to get uh, more visibility to you. Uh, that's why we have HTTP errors uh, here uh, detected by the JavaScript agent. We are always detecting them either within the context of a user action or even in between user actions because you have there maybe timed uh, requests that are not triggered by a, a user that are going off. However, from an error perspective, we have you covered here. And as I said before, it may be the case that you have third parties in, uh, in there or you have your CDNs in, uh, in between. And, yep, Andy, yep. you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something because the first question, <laughs> the first question actually just came in. Um, and this might be something very basic, but for people that are new with Dianatrace, real user monitoring, it's, it's interesting to know. The question is, what do you consider as an error? What are all errors? What are all errors? We have JavaScript errors, we have HEB errors and custom errors. That's the three error types that we have. Uh, JavaScript errors are obviously uh, in your JavaScript code. Uh, we are detecting there uh, for years now uh, exceptions and are reporting those back as uh, JavaScript errors. Mm -hmm. HTTP errors and it's actually a good question and I wanted to go into the config a little bit later on but from an HTTP E error perspective, uh, we have uh, enhanced here the error configuration, and out of the box, uh, these are the rules of uh, for for errors. So we have HTTP 500 to 599, which are errors that we capture. They are actually impacting AppDex, and also our Davis AI uh, is considering those errors. But then you have, from an HEB uh, error perspective, you maybe have there uh, the FAF icon, and you're getting a 404 error on it. Um, this can be due to some browser problems, uh, or you may have really not uh, uh, the FAF icon deployed. However, what is the impact on the end user? Or do you really actually want to see it? That's basically what the capture uh, is all about. 
should the if the FAF icon is not delivered, it really doesn't impact the the end user. Hence, we said like, hey, this should not impact the app decks. And for sure, you don't want to wake up anyone in operations saying like, hey, FAF icon is uh, not available to our end consumers. So we really have here uh, three levels of how you can uh, configure how we react to er errors and actually what we consider errors. We see here, for example, the 404 uh, for file ending or URLs ending on .js. We say like, yep, uh, if JavaScript files are missing, this is probably something that is has a significant impact on your web application. Hence, you want to alert uh, your operations folks. The same for CSS. However, in general, a 404 error is something that you want to know about, that you want to investigate, so we are capturing those. They may impact the user, so that's why we have here configured that they are impacting the user. But uh, in general, a 404 error, or in general 400 uh, errors, we don't want to uh, alert operations on those. Mm -hmm. That okay. makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. I think that's exactly what the the question was all about. And there's just a follow up question that just comes in on that. Um, I think you are showing this now on an individual application level. Are there also mm -hmm. global rules that you can specify that are across all applications? Uh, the out of the box ones are the global rules. Uh, there is no uh, config available for. Uh, there is no global config uh, currently available in the product. Mm -hmm. but but with every new app, basically these are the default ones, and that makes obviously a lot of sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the default ones. For the custom errors, uh, since we are in here already, uh, we only start with capturing those. Custom errors, uh, to give you an example, are around uh, are triggered via the JavaScript uh, modules API. So you really have to trigger them. I'll show you an example later on. And uh, what you have is there an API that can provide a key, a value, and a hint. And since you don't know what uh, you are uh, putting there and uh, sending into Dynatrace here, uh, we said like, hey, by default we only capture those. And if you have then specific keys and values, you then can define basically what the um, what the effect uh, should look like. So if you for HEB or so, and um, for custom errors, you jump in here, add a new rule. You say like, hey, the key begins, uh, ends, contains our usual um, uh, comparison functions that we have here. Uh, so I can say like, key is form field. Uh, what is it? Um, buying uh, form. So something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I say like, hey, this is an important form. Uh, so I'm really investigating there maybe form field validation errors. That was the idea behind. So you have there maybe the phone number that you are asking uh, your customers to punch in. Uh, however, you have their restrictions to say like, hey, it needs to be a US uh, phone number. And then the poor Klaus with uh, just this your European phone number just tries to punch in there and try to figure out what to uh, put in so that the form field validation doesn't fail anymore. So what you can do there is really put in uh, a report uh, error that allows you then to see people who are struggling here with filling out a form, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's totally up to you. You can define what uh, should happen, should it impact uh, just capture it. You obviously want to do it. Uh, should it impact the user? And again, should uh, Davis alert you on this? Perfect. Thank you, Klaus. Okay. So, once you have set up, uh, if you are happy with the out-of-the-box config, you don't have to change anything there. But uh, we start then capturing the data for you. And what you then can do actually is you can start analyzing. So you can go in and say like, hey, by type, by context, uh, what happens is you jump into our multidimensional analytics screen and you have all the usual uh, capabilities here. 
uh, you can start say like, hey, we want to focus today on HEB errors because this is something that we brought to you uh, new. Uh, we go, uh, we pick here the time frame a little bit. What I can do down in in the uh, on demand analysis here in the detail analysis, I could start say like, okay, I feel lucky. I want to help today our neighbors because it's uh, Christmas time. Let's. Uh, uh, the Austrians help uh, the Germans. So here we go. Let's uh, have a look into what are the errors that are mostly impacting the Germans. And ah, we have here actually an interesting one. We have here an HDB 500 on Easy Travel REST uh, bookings API. So if we then analyze one of these HDB errors, we're automatically getting here the, this nice little overview. It tells me how often did it occur. It was actually six times in six uh, separate sections from six uh, users. Uh, obviously, since we have set the filter to Germany, it's everybody out of Germany. And it seems that the Chrome uh, browser is uh, here uh, the top browser. All of them are on Windows 10. Every, every error is coming from a third party. We have here a couple of error details. Um, and again, the entire URL that has been uh, requested. We also see which uh, agent, which Dynatrace agent actually detected it. And this, uh, these errors uh, have been detected on both ends. So they were actually hitting our one agent, our service agent. And as you can see, we over, over here you can also see the uh, error rule that we discussed before. So this is an error that actually impacts or it gets captured, impacts AppDex and also uh, is considered by Davis. And if you would like to create here from right from here, just a more specific one, you just uh, say like, hey, create rule from this error. And we'll bring you back here. Uh, to the HB error rule set and say like, hey, uh, the URL should equal exactly that URL. Now you can define a different impact. So that's how easy you can add here additional er error rules mm -hmm. if you need. I think, I think that's, that's great because you it makes the workflow easier, like the flow through our UI easier. And, and Klaus, uh, because it's just another question came in, uh, what about uh, some automation on this? Are some of these changes also configurable through REST API? Sure. There is the error config is uh, also available via REST API. So you have there the REST endpoints where you can configure all the errors. Oh, that's awesome. Because we just, uh, I think we talked about this earlier. We had just a customer in Germany, another German, right? That's, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Up, uh, they, they, they just uh, published on on Git a Kubernetes operator that is automatically creating synthetic tests for services that are deployed to Kubernetes that have an external exposed endpoint and they're also using the synthetic API so it's great to know that these things can also be configured through an API which means people can bake this into their delivery pipeline even so that's really really nice. Yeah. I have also good, a little bit of more good news. Some of the uh, configs uh, that we have in the application settings are going to be added to the REST API. So if it is not there yet, we have there currently something in the pipe. So pretty soon you will get there more uh, abilities on what you can configure via API. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not done with the screen yet, so uh, let's explore a little bit further this area. And uh, a thing uh, that is really uh, important sometimes is that you actually can uh, have a look at one of these user sessions. So what we have down here, uh, a sample set of users uh, where it's like, hey, those were impacted uh, by the error. And what we have done here is we brought uh, sessions as you know, we have session replay uh, as well in our portfolio. Uh, we brought sessions that actually have a replay on it uh, up front. So you will get them preferred listed here and you can uh, click on them. And we have here our famous Heiner Hastings and actually we can uh, replay this session. We can have a look, how does it look like for the uh, end user? Uh, what's the problem? Let me 
just jump forward here. So we have uh, up front here this uh, error problem. So when he clicks on this book journey button, that's where he uh, gets into troubles. He gets there this weird uh, summary and um, yeah, cannot really uh, finish his uh, booking process. And this is something that really helps you to uh, identify the the problem and also have then uh, something that you can use to communicate. So you find this problem in production, you know nothing about uh, this URL, uh, what the impact is to the user, you can view here uh, the recording, see what the impact is to the end uh, consumer and then actually decide based on that, is this a red flag? Do I have to uh, go with a priority one ticket all the way back uh, to uh, R&D so that they change this, uh, this problem? Or is it just a minor thing that really is not, it can wait maybe a week or till the next release? It's not uh, something that you really want to uh, push hard on. Uh, but you want to create a ticket and let engineers know what the issue actually is. Makes sense? Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, and there's a lot, there's a couple of questions coming in, but I, I will keep most of them to the end because it's like a, a questions from all different sorts of areas, Klaus, so just that, that you know. Okay. Um, and okay. also, as a, as, a, as a reminder, folks, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature in the uh, webinar platform and post questions. So, uh, jumping back here uh, to my previous screen, uh, what else uh, does this screen hold uh, right away for us? It uh, lets me know how, which user actions are impacted, so it's always just a single user action that is impacted. Yeah, we have here the geolocation filter, so if you have there something, uh, something that sticks out out of a certain region, uh, you have right away here uh, this view. You also have down here distributions on the browser operating system and again the origin uh, that uh, helps you identify where you have uh, your struggles with. And going back uh, to the analysis screen, okay, something is missing. find it again, the back button works. So here we are back to our multi-dimensional analytics screen. I can also use now this uh, this uh, information here. So like, okay, I want to filter for this particular error. So I'm adding here to my Germany filter, additional uh, filters, and I can see then again here, it's uh, this key user action that actually is impacted or if it is not a key user action, I would see the list of uh, impacted user actions down here. I can move forward from here and on the uh, particular user action, it is now filtered for this particular error. So I see in this screen only instances of this user action that have this particular error on it. And uh, we have added, we have uh, remodeled a little bit the uh, user action screen. Um, so as errors are really that important, we move them right up here into the upper right corner for those who are really familiar with the screen. Uh, the contributor breakdown and the way to the waterfall moved over here. Uh, in the error card, again, similar information like on the start screen. You have the errors by type, you have the errors by origin, and you have here a table of all the errors and you can see that JavaScript error is actually paired with this HTTP error. And you can move forward uh, even to the waterfall analysis and you have also on the waterfall analysis those errors listed. So we have here a new top finding on the uh, merged waterfall, on the aggregated waterfall. It says like you have six JavaScript errors, six resource uh, requests failed. If we go down here, uh, we see them highlighted in red uh, and we see that six of six of those errors actually uh, failed. Should you have there a CDN uh, issue for example, so that's something that we really have uh, already invest, uh, seen with, with, with customers. Uh, we've seen there scenarios where 
one out of four requests actually failed. And uh, then the, uh, or, uh, the, the, the G breakdown was really nice uh, to have because we're all coming out of the same region. So we really could identify here that in certain regions uh, we had their CDN outages. And if you think about it, how could you figure out before that there is a CDN issue? The only, the only way uh, was basically to set up uh, a synthetic test, a synthetic monitor. Uh, the problem, though, is that if you think about a CDN, they have a lot of CDN nodes. And if you, you must have been really lucky with your synthetic test to really hit one of those nodes. Uh, like your users did, where that node was failing. However, now you are really uh, seeing those errors here. So that's actually Klaus. I think that's that's a, a good kind of best practice too, right? I mean, synthetic is awesome for your general availability mm -hmm. testing, uh, but then combining it with real user monitoring because you're really monitoring from every single user, you mm -hmm. really get to know whether there are very specific geographical or browser specific or ISP specific problems, right? I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. the key yeah. thing. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, absolutely. And yeah, so we, we discussed here a little bit these, uh, these flows in the products so far. And I want to jump back right to the uh, actual overview screen here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some other things that we brought into the product. So we have here the HTTP errors list right up front here. This is a good starting point. So what we've seen with, uh, with our uh, customers uh, that were participating in the preview, that this list is significant. So this list is really long and has usually a lot of errors with a lot of, uh, with a high frequency. Um, so you've seen me before talking about this, uh, let Davis know. Uh, this is, however, today not active. So Davis will not right now alert you on, uh, on, on any of those errors. There is a, the reasoning behind this, we really wanted to give you uh, now the time to get your uh, errors sorted to look in there and really start optimizing first and then Davis will kick in in one of uh, our future releases and he will then start alerting you on those. That's really important to know. The other important thing to know is that you can that we really pushed uh, to the limits of our uh, JavaScript or what is possible with JavaScript. So you see here some with HTTP unknown. So uh, these unknown ones, they are uh, due to browser restrictions. Uh, specifically for requests to third parties, uh, browsers are uh, limiting us uh, in what we can see and whether we get HTTP status codes or not. So for an XHR uh, request, we are getting a status code. However, for an image request, for example, we, uh, you don't get uh, the status code. However, we have enhanced our JavaScript agent so that uh, the JavaScript agent actually can detect uh, whether images are failing yes or no if they are served from a third party. Uh, those are then marked with this HTTP unknown because we don't have the exact status code. It could be a 404, it could be a 500, we don't know. Uh, however, we know that the uh, image could not be loaded and hence uh, we want you to be aware of it. This is something that we want to report on. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, that's, uh, that's it from an HTTP errors standpoint. I want to dive into the next uh, part that we've added. It's the custom errors and uh, the way how I create, we have no custom errors in this system here. The way how I've created some uh, nice uh, custom errors is actually uh, on this screen here. We have uh, in this app custom errors that says my validation error, Dynatrace validation failed with a, a certain number. And the way how I produce it, and uh, it's a really nice way of showing it, is uh, actually I 
leveraged our synthetic solution here uh, to create uh, those errors. So I can go from the app uh, to the synthetic tests that have been assigned to this uh, to this application, and and while this is loading, while, while this is loading, Klaus, just one one quick point, um, folks. If you have any questions, you know, put them into the question feature as a Q and A box in uh, the panel in your um, you know webinar control panel. So mm -hmm. make sure that you put them in. I will uh, moderate it at the end of your live session, right? Once you're done with your demos. And I know you were also, oh, here we go, right? So talk, talk long are. enough. <laughs> yeah, you talked long enough. Thanks uh, for uh, bridging the gap. I mean, it's uh, our demo dev, our, uh, really that's uh, where our engineers are uh, jumping in and putting in uh, stuff uh, all the time. And uh, if we look here at uh, the recorded click path and actually the script version of this recorded click path, you can see that we uh, that I just added here the DTRAM report custom error. I added here my validation error, the key. Then we have here uh, the value that I've added. And actually we have here, it happened on page, uh, yeah, and random uh, number. Uh, that we that I've put it in here. This is how you can easily add those errors into your website. So just do a DRAM report custom error, key, value, and hint, and just report it back to Dynatrace. And Dynatrace will pick it up. So, and, so Klaus, Klaus, just yeah. so that I understand, and also maybe for folks that are wondering, so you were just leveraging here a synthetic test to kind of, you know, simulate and create yeah. custom errors. But yeah. typically, you will have your web developers, if they have some JavaScript logic on their front end, and they say, hey, this is actually an error, then I want to report this back to the analysis, whether it's a business error, whether it's some technical problem, whatever it is, you can report it back and then Dynatris will show you the number of errors and obviously tie it back to the individual user session. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the custom errors. Uh, and uh, from an analysis perspective, we already uh, went through the, uh, the, the steps, so the steps are the, exactly the same ones. Um, and yeah, going back to the applications, here we go. We have our easy travel. And if I go to my custom errors, if I look at the specific error, you have again these occurrence statistics. Uh, they are 100% occurring on synthetic monitors, obviously, because that's how I simulate it. And you're getting uh, here this additional thing on the, on, on the error entity screen. The hint list is basically showing you like what we've built into the in the, the in the call, the uh, the hint is really just listed here. Should help you to figure out what the problem is, to figure the details out. I spoke about the phone number problem, so you could add here, for example, uh, this phone number that somebody tried to punch in, and that was uh, basically failing um, uh, was was failing the the form field validation. Yeah, um, with that, I think we can go into the Q&A session. Perfect, awesome. Hey Klaus, just uh, before we go into Q&A, let me actually turn my video on again. So, the, just that I really understand, because I think this is really powerful, because this allows front-end developers to send information back to Dynatrace uh, about really things that just went wrong in the user flow or, or, or something that probably is hard to detect otherwise because it's not a traditional mm -hmm. HTTP error, it's not a JavaScript error, it is something wrong in the logic and now we can send it back to Dynatrace and then you can analyze, you know, hey maybe this is a problem that primarily happens in Europe with all of our mm -hmm. different languages and strange character sets and people have problems mm -hmm. typing in, I don't know, their names with the umlauts and stuff like that, right? There's, there's a lot of interesting use cases here I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So let's go to the back to the question. Um, in the very beginning, Klaus, when you started with the app and you created a new 
uh, endpoint check right from the app with the new option that is mm -hmm. available. The question mm -hmm. that came in is, um, it seems the, the test was automatically created for a couple of locations for a specific time frame. The question is, is this, can this be changed? So can the defaults be changed over which locations are they actually generated? How does this work? So let's have a look at this uh, particular test. So automatically it was uh, in this case setting it up from Beijing, Amazon, US East. So some, some uh, random locations out of all the locations that we have uh, available. Mm -hmm. um, what it creates, it creates a synthetic test for you. And yes, you have all the freedom to change it. So if you go into the edit mode, you can uh, make out of this single step, even a multi-step test. Mm -hmm. You can uh, go into the frequency section and say like, hey, 15 minutes is not often enough. I need it every five minutes. Uh, you also want to change uh, the locations if you want. Uh, all of mm -hmm. that is just possible. It's just uh, a help to get you started. Mm -hmm. I guess um, the, the default selection you said it, it, it ran, it, it picked three locations. Yeah. I would assume if it has traffic, it's across the globe. It across the globe. It's, okay. uh, it's, it's really three locations across the globe. Mm -hmm. So one Norum, one EMEA, one uh, APEC location will be picked and uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And obviously, if this is not your target market, then you can still, as you just showed, go in, change it as you like, and, and optimize it for your own use cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The next question, Klaus, uh, you earlier you showed how to define these HTTP error rules. So, for instance, yeah. if somebody is not interested in the HTTP 500s to be reported, uh, the question is, is there any plan on propagating these errors also to the backend? Meaning, on the back end, we also have error detection. So, if you are not mm -hmm. interested in the front end errors, mm -hmm. um, are there any plans to also promote them to the back end and ignore them, for instance? That's a good idea. It's currently not planned, though. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something to, yeah, that we can think about. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, a couple of questions that came in uh, that, you know, I think are. Uh, not necessarily related to the stuff that you showed today, but around RAM. So the, and it seems this is definitely from uh, an experienced user. The question is, any, what's the update or the, what's the status of getting session properties of live sessions? So if you have a live user uh, session. Nothing changed there. So uh, session properties are still uh, only available for finished sessions. Okay. Um, any plan to change this? So is there anything coming? It's uh, currently not planned uh, as well. So mm -hmm. there is uh, for April a plan to give uh, to, to, to get a bigger uh, session property update. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, this will not address uh, the live user sessions, however. Okay. By the what way, this we, should, we should mark that. Uh, next year, April, we have to do another performance clinic on session and action properties. Of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Follow-up question. Uh, plans to have more than one value for, se for session properties per session? So uh, that would be one. user action properties, actually. So a session property has, per definition, uh, is only existing once per session. Mm -hmm. However, we are planning to uh, push user action properties also uh, towards the user sessions so that you have them available in, in the user session view. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's uh, definitely planned and that will allow you to have then multiple different values uh, throughout the user session available. Okay, and if this, I think the question here goes, what if, if the same you know, property comes from multiple user actions, will that be, I guess, the first, the last, will this be configurable? Yeah, that's uh, the idea to basically allow you, allowing you to say like, hey, do I want to have the first occurrence? Do I want to have the last occurrence for numeric properties? Since we are here, let me click on it. For numeric properties, uh, we're also thinking about min, max, average, uh, that, uh, that kind of aggregations. Yeah, that's definitely something that we uh, want to push. 
And uh, there's a question around uh, more charting capabilities. Is there anything new from a charting perspective? I know you showed us obviously the out-of-the-box dashboards that we have and uh, the out-of-the-box diagnostics capabilities and workflows. Anything new from a charting mm -hmm. metrics perspective? Yes, so I'm going now into the demo dev, so there is something coming to you pretty pretty soon as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from a charting perspective, we have had a lot of requests for uh, getting uh, calculated metrics for RUM. And yes, here we, here we have this uh, button, so if I subscribe here, um, yeah, let's say Browser That's family. Awesome. That's awesome. Say I just want to have Chrome. I want to have the performance KPI, uh, something that we don't have out of the box. Let's say the DNS lookup time. And you can now uh, actually create, or you will be able to create, uh, it's not yet there, uh, mm -hmm. to create a metric. You give it a name. Uh, also, f again, for the API, you have it here. Mm -hmm. You create your metric and uh, you may know this flow already from yeah. uh, services and log analytics, but uh, that's another performance clinic that we sh yeah. should have pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, so that's pretty is, awesome. Uh, this really allows you to to, to uh, go into the details. So that is yeah. also available uh, for. We, uh, let me see if I have here a good example. I think that one is is actually filled. So. Uh, this is actually, uh, for those that haven't seen it, so uh, at the end we have those user action properties mm -hmm. uh, listed here, so you will be able to create from a certain user action properties, also uh, starting from here, you can create uh, metrics. You can also click, uh, that's uh, also something that we have planned here, and will be with you in 2020. That's, that's nice. 2019. <laughs> yeah. Well, 2019 is almost over, right? The That's the good thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is this is amazing, and it follows the improvements we've done around the calculated service metrics, where you can also create your calculated service metrics based on pretty much everything on the backend services, including the request attributes. And in your case, it is the session properties, which you can also include here. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. There, mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, that means if we create these these metrics, you can then obviously put them on charts, and then we have all these these new capabilities. That's great. Exactly. Uh, another topic, and you know, I also you need to say if this is uh, the, the the topic for you, but the USQL, uh, so the um, real users uh, SQL query language, or the mm -hmm. the question here is. Uh, is there going to be an option for USQL alerting? So if some values, uh, let's say, go out of the norm, then send an alert. I would assume this will also be covered with what you are showing here with these custom metrics, because then these tie in with custom alerts. Uh, so uh, a lot of things that you may want to do on uh, USQL. There is there is one, one important thing. USQL is applied on uh, sessions that are uh, actually finished. So from an alerting perspective, they might not be uh, perfect because you you will always have to delay. Mm -hmm. So uh, those uh, metrics that you are creating here are based on user actions. And uh, if you uh, create here uh, a new metric, you can actually then go in here and create uh, right away for this particular metric an alert. Mm -hmm. And uh, from an alerting perspective, uh, I would uh, suggest that you investigate, once you're getting the create metric feature, <laughs> uh, you will investigate whether you can uh, reproduce your uh, USQL uh, somehow in the multidimensional analytics uh, screen and uh, then create an, uh, an alert from here. Mm. Oh, that's perfect. That's also what we do on the server side, right? We, mm. You can define your custom metrics and then the alerts, and then there's, there's so many great new features with the custom alerting definition here where it shows you, uh, it gives you an overview of these values over time, and then it gives you a suggestion on what your alert actually should be so that you don't get over-alerted. Important so, if you jump, uh, if you create the, the metric right away, uh, since we are just with the I create now the metric, starting to write the metric, 
uh, these suggestions might not be here, like you of see course. it here. Yeah, of course. Uh, because the data is not there yet. Yeah, but it, this is really cool, right? Once, if you have a metric that has already data, then it gives you nice suggestions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. All right, next question. Uh, it's around user action naming. The question is, um, when, we, when it comes to user action naming, is it going to be possible in the future to also include HTTP parameters, or is it already possible to include HTTP parameters for user actions? Is not possible today. Uh, is something uh, that we are currently considering. Mm -hmm. uh, of adding because we are also with the April property update uh, adding there an additional capability on how to uh, capture uh, uh, HTTP parameters as properties mm -hmm. and uh, as you might have noticed uh, for all the, let me jump back to the applications here for uh, for user action naming all the uh, options that you have for uh, for properties are also available uh, for user action naming. The only exception to this rule is the server-side request attributes. So if I go into user action naming and I create here a placeholder rule, I can pick from here uh, CSS selector, JavaScript variable, meta tag, and cookie value. That's, uh, that's the mechanics that you have today. Mm -hmm. um, the request parameters are a topic, f yeah, for the mm -hmm. next uh, big, bigger update on properties. Mm -hmm. But what about you know if it says page URL? Doesn't the page URL include parameters? Assuming they are HTTP GET parameters and they're part of the URL, or is the URL just the first if piece? If it is, actually, yeah. you're right. If it is, then it's. Uh, Part so like the yeah. selected yeah. location here. Yeah, and so then you can extract the parameter. Ext yes, you can extract it out. Very mm -hmm. cool. Awesome. Um, next question is: uh, What about is, it going, is there going to be a metric available or coming that allows you to calculate the time spent between user actions? So when people are kind of moving from A to B to C to D, right? How long? How much yeah. time is spent? Yeah. Uh, is uh, subject to roadmap, but uh, will take some time. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good answer, right? I mean, we are, so that means we are aware, obviously, of these requirements or requests. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next question is, uh, like a user journey dashboard, is is there something planned where you have like a more better visual view of how people are really navigating through the system, like a journey flow, um, like a service flow visualization of the user journey? Same answer. Same answer. <laughs> Subject to rope. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely something that will help uh, people figure out how people are navigating through. But again, this is uh, uh, not in in the near term uh, mm -hmm. available, but uh, subject to to roadmap and yes, mm -hmm. definitely useful. Yeah, cool. Well, it seems there's a lot of topics that we can pick up again. You know, as time goes goes by and uh, these features will become available, that we have another mm -hmm. performance clinic mm -hmm. together. That's always good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, or kind of like a repeat, maybe, but. Uh, from the errors perspective, so you showed a lot of diagnostic use cases, right? How do you diagnose? Yeah. So, what's the? Is there is there anything else that needs to be done to to get this level of diagnostics other than just enabling RAM, or is it just enabling RAM and then by default you get just enable RAM and by default you have? Uh, let me see if we have the default. Now there is already a little bit more than just the default set, but. Uh, if you remove the first two lines, that's mm -hmm. the default set. Uh, yeah, that is there automatically. Nothing uh, to change. Yeah, awesome, cool. And then, I mean, you actually helped me today, right? I was, I'm just on site with one of our uh, customers and partners here, and we instrumented uh, an app where we had to use. Um, Basically, uh, you know, JavaScript only injection or JavaScript mm -hmm. 
uh, on, on the instrumentation where we couldn't install anything on the server side. And um, that was also very interesting. So that means this not only works for applications where you can install the one agent on the back end, this also works for uh, applications that you don't have under control in the back end yeah. where you can inject the JavaScript agent on these pages. Um, yeah. So that's, that's so also great. If, if you look at our deployment process, you have there uh, those options. You can do... Uh, even even if you don't have the chance to inject uh, the Java or add the JavaScript tag into the website uh, directly, you can even go with the browser extension monitoring that allows you to really set up for uh, monitoring via a Google Chrome extension or a Microsoft Edge extension. Mm -hmm. um, you set up basically, you give it a name, you say like, you specify a URL. This is basically what I did for the BBC example that you saw before. Mm -hmm. And whenever I'm browsing now, so uh, let me, uh, sorry, that's the, that's the synthetic test. But whenever you're browsing then to this uh, particular URL, so we have here the BBC CEO UK, I obviously cannot add the JavaScript tag yeah. directly into the BBC website. However, uh, what I've done, I've created there this uh, this app, and uh, actually I've also installed here uh, the extension for uh, Chrome in this case. Mm -hmm. I connected it to the application, and whenever I open now a window and start browsing uh, on the BBC uh, website, uh, the uh, plugin becomes active and starts reporting my session. So all those clicks that I do here on this website, though I have not uh, been able to inject my JavaScript agent directly in into on the server side, I'm getting here the real user sessions. So mm -hmm. if I uh, analyze here my user sessions for this BBC CEO UK, you see basically that it was just me who uh, did a little bit of uh, browsing on this uh, site earlier, I can uh, actually look into those uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. So same actually, you can actually, actually, you can then look back every day how much time we actually worked versus looking at news websites. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then obviously, I mean, this is a great feature for, um, for I guess, for enterprises where you have SaaS solutions that don't allow you to inject the JavaScript tag uh, for whatever reason, um, to, because most of them are typically providing you templates that you can customize and you can add something in. But if you have no c control at all, the browser yep. plugin is still a great opportunity for that. That's pretty exactly. cool. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly. All right. Hey, Klaus, do me a favor, please. Go uh, quickly back to the slides. I think there's like two or three slides that I would like to show before we kind of close it out here. So first of all, Klaus, thank you so much for uh, giving us the overview of the new capabilities around error diagnostics, around the custom errors that's really cool, and also answering all these questions that came in and giving us an outlook on what's coming. For the folks that are on the line, uh, remember these sessions are recorded. They will be put up on Dynagy's University as well as YouTube. There's a lot of other events that are ongoing and a lot of other material. So here is just a set of links that you know bring you to more information. And then if you do me a favor and move to the next slide. Then this is very important for you. At the, in the first week of February of 2020, we are going back to Las Vegas for our perform conference. And it is two hot days, right? Monday and Tuesday, Klaus, we listened to the folks. We are now doing four kind of blocks of hands-on training day, Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. If you want to go to the hot days, and I think, Klaus, I mean, we've been running these for the last couple of years. It's yeah. always great to get people in the room and do hands-on. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh looking really forward to it. it. It will be a massive hot day followed by really uh, exciting content on Wednesday and Thursday throughout uh, the days. Uh, actually this year it's not on your slide actually but uh, this year we are getting for some industries some specials so uh, where we really double down even on specific industry verticals. Uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Pretty cool. And so, folks, make sure 
uh, places are filling up quickly, so if you want to get a chance to do a hands-on training there or get to the conference, go to perform.dynatrace.com and, and secure your tickets. It's a nice Christmas present too, right? Um, so that's it, Klaus. Thank you so much for this session and um, everybody else for attending and for the questions. If you have more questions coming up at a later point, answers.dynatrace.com or obviously you know who we are and then you can probably figure out how to get in contact with us. But I think that's it for today. Thank you so much.